And now, a word from our sponsors. The Oyster Recovery Partnership is the nonprofit expert in Chesapeake Bay oyster restoration. Oyster Recovery Partnership has planted more than 9 billion oysters on 3,000 acres of reef and recycled more than 250 bushels of shell. Everyone benefits from a healthy Chesapeake Bay. Poor water quality and declining habitats can be reversed. Oysters are the answer. Hey, right. what's going on, good people? It's Gardener Douglas, your Oyster Ninja. I'm here with Miss Trish Whetstone, um, and uh, she is doing some great things for the seafood community, for the uh, just this great things that educating, you know, and we all need those educational moments um, to learn more, to do better, and all that good stuff. So Trish, how are you feeling? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks for having me on here. I think the bigger our circle is, the better things will be. And if we can all connect, you know, and kind of link up, you know, that's what it's all about. 100%. So just tell, a little, tell us a little bit, like, you know, why you got into this. But first of all, you're like, you're like a fish, or you are, or you were a fishmonger also? Yeah. So my, uh, my, my tale of engagement with the sea is, uh, you know, like so many people, um, a bit of a vocational scenic route, but uh, I originally um, got into seafood. I mean, I've been interested in food and like food acquisition and local food systems from a very, very young age. I grew up in Vancouver and went, um, spent a lot of my childhood in the Vancouver Granville Island public market. So fishmongers, farmers, all of that sort of fresh, accessible food right there. And it just was very much a part of my life always. And then, um, and yeah, I've been a, I've been a seafoodie since, since a very early age. I was never afraid to eat an oyster. So I started young, but um, I, yeah, I ended up getting into uh, the live event and theater production industry. That's actually my background. Um, and after years of doing that, I was like, you know what? I really love food. It's a, you know, I mean, it's a very non-negotiable need in this world and for our sustenance. Um, and I was starting to just connect more with, uh, with people who were more in, in the food system and farmers and um, seafood people just in my own life. And I was like, you know what, this is the direction I want to go. Um, and I found a gig working at a, 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 it was a national historic site in Steveston, BC. Uh, called the Gulf of Georgia Cannery, which is also a, um, so it's a 120 year old historic salmon cannery, uh, the biggest that was in BC. And it uh, has turned into a national historic site and a museum about the commercial fishing history of the West Coast, which at the time I was like, is a little bit on the niche side. But then once I got into the seafood industry, I was like, oh no, this is a deep dive. Like within the niche, there are a lot of niches. Um, so I did that, I did events for them, lots of education pieces, lots of opportunities to really engage with not only um, the history of seafood and fisheries in BC, um, but also to connect with, you know, real people and kind of realize, okay, like there's a lot of folks out there who just straight do not know where their food's coming from or the history or the people behind it or the stories behind it. And I was like, all right, and then I, um, you know, so I was doing events and then there was a plague and events stopped existing. <laughs> I think we all remember that part. <laughs> right, right. And I, yeah, so I went into being a fishmonger uh, because I was like, you know what? I love seafood. I love this industry. Um, I wanna continue to participate in it. And I was like, you know what? I don't know anything about the actual ground floor of like supply chain, wholesale, retail, you know, that consumer interaction. And I was like, okay, like let's, and also like learn how to break down a whole fish, learn how to shuck oysters. Like let's get hands on. I mean, you know, the, the world's already looking pretty down and dirty. Let's put our feet in the fish guts. Like, let's go. <laughs> otherwise I'm just going to sit there thinking about the fact that we're in the middle of a global pandemic all the time. And that would suck. Right. So, so uh, yeah, I got into got into doing the fishmonger thing and I still um I still do it in the summer times um there's a uh down I live in Gibson's BC now there's uh 
a fish boat that's uh, on the dock. It's a stationary fish sales boat. We buy our fish and crab and spot prawns from our local fishermen that are moored right there in the dock. So it's the local Sunshine Coast fishing fleet. And so that's very cool. Um, so yeah, it's like half the time I'm, you know, online, educating, talking to people, connecting with people, figuring out how to tell these stories better from a marketing perspective and from an education perspective. And the other half the time I'm face to face with people delivering unsolicited TED talks on where your spot prawns are coming from, pulling them out of a live tank and being like, hey kid, want to see a crab? So it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's very hands-on. I do love the fishmonger part for that. Do you think that, um, that those two jobs, like being a fishmonger and doing the talks, um, do you think they sharpen each other? Like, do you think one, you know, they you kind of work it together and it kind of makes you better? Absolutely. Um, I'm constantly looking for looking for things and opportunities that corroborate well with each other to, like you said, you know, sharpen each other um, and lend, you know, new perspective and information to each other. So like the Trish Talks Fish thing, which is, you know, it, it actually arose as a bit of a joke from my fishmonger work. Um, so I was, you know, I'd have customers come up to me and they'd ask a question that really revealed. And it just started to become more and more revealed to me that I was like, there are people coming here who literally are like deer in the headlights, salmon, halibut, cod, that's it. That's all they know. Oh my gosh, it's so expensive. You know, how does this work? I had a piece of halibut once and I didn't like it because I cooked it for an hour and a half on the barbecue not going to work out for you, bud. Um, you know, just, and why are these prawns so expensive and this and that? And I was like, there's definitely a disconnect in terms of the food literacy that's delivered to us through our education system and just generally, and, you know, the actual people who are, you know, going to buy the food. And so, you know, it kind of became this joke that like Trish delivers unsolicited TED talks about seafood. You know, and someone would be like, oh, well, why are these prawns from, you know, from Vietnam so much less expensive than the prawns that are local from BC? And I would be like, okay, I have a lot of information behind that. How much time do you have? <laughs> do you have water? Like, have you gone to the bathroom? Do you have a comfortable seat? Because like this might take some time. <laughs> so it kind of turned into this running joke of like the, you know, Trish talks fish thing. And uh, because that was really like my only face-to-face -face with my community during the pandemic. And I had just moved there. Everybody got to know me in my, you know, humorously small town of <laughs> as like Trish talk, Trish does fish, Trish talks fish. So then it kind of out of that, out of the fishmonger thing, it became the education piece. And I was like, Hey, you know, maybe there's a way to take this out of the store and, you know, into the classroom or into the grocery store or into restaurants and, you know, and, and community kitchens and food security organizations and deliver this piece because there's, you know, one thing I know you're in the seafood industry. And I think a lot of us talk about this all the time is that um, our industry is fairly terrible at telling its own stories. <laughs> um, and I've spoken, you know, I've connected with lots of of people involved in the industry about this, um, like you know Emily D'Souza from CSA with Emily, um, Megan Waldrop from Partners of Commercial Fisheries, and a lot of the similarity across the board is that we aren't getting our information out there. We aren't not only our product information, but also the stories of what those fishermen and sea farmers and people on the ground and people connected to the fishing industry are are doing and the humanity behind it. So people like they don't know who we are and they don't know where it's coming from and I don't know what we're selling and they don't know why it's so expensive um, or what to do with it when they get home. So I was like, maybe I can find a way to like bridge this gap and educate them, get them excited through doing like hands on events and stuff and then direct them to good sources of holistically sustainable seafood like you know be that brands fishermen directly whatnot through doing like marketing and copywriting and so yeah I was just like let's just do a three-pronged attack like 
So, and so uh, yeah, they really do like they lend to each other always. So I guess before I get into the fish, how how did you get to a point where you could tell your story better and market yourself as that person? Uh, well, that's I mean, that's something that I'm still working on and is a you know, it's a daily it's a daily effort. Um, you know, I it's funny because I'm one of the things I did over the pandemic was, you know, because I had some free time. <laughs> is that uh, I took some copywriting courses just to sharpen my writing skills up. I always, I'd always done writing, I'd always done content writing um, and I really enjoyed it. But I was like, okay, there's, there's a call to action that needs to be taken here in terms of seafood. And I'm like, how do I do that? And then I was like, oh, that's what copywriting is. Okay, maybe I'm, I, should, I should learn what that is. <laughs> um, so I took some courses on in that and in branding and whatnot. So that's really helped me to refine what it is that I'm like, who I am in terms of Trish Talks Fish, who I am in terms of my goals, my ethics, like where that heart led work is coming from and communicate that to the audience. Um, and I mean, like I said, I'm still refining that. Like after this, I've got a Q and A with a group of copywriters that is literally about like brand voice and intention. <laughs> so it's like, I'm always working on, um, you know, ways to better communicate who I am and why I do this and why it's valuable. Because at the end of the day, it's like, you know, people are busy, time is tight, money is tight. Like you better tell me within seven seconds or why I should pay attention to this. Um, so it definitely is, that's a very kind of new part for me over the past, like two, three years is getting into that, like into that marketing side of it. And of course I'm better at marketing everybody other than myself. Like I will sell, I will sell you like to anybody, me. Right. I'm like, Oh no, I'm, I'm good. I'm over here. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. And that's why I asked. Um, but my next question is, uh, so how do you tell the the story of the fish like does that look does that uh is, does that involve collaborations with um brands or uh fisher fishermen or how, how does that work so it's it's always a it's always diff a different approach depending on like the context of where your audience is so for example if i'm you know if i'm telling the story of the fish like and i'm working on the fish boat and like that's my platform that day then i'm you know i've got the fish in front of them i'm showing them the belly i'm pointing at like if the boat that caught it is in harbor i'm like that's the boat that caught it the guy who runs its name is this he had a baby this year you can go check out the boat go have a look like you know take a picture with it and and it kind of like connect I really try to find ways to connect people to that whole chain of where it's come from and bring that into like a local space where they can just stop and be like oh like this this came from a person like it makes that connection um in a way that I think that fisheries is often lacking um and then when it comes to you know workshops or if I'm doing events um, I definitely do like to try and collaborate with local, um, either local restaurants. Right now I'm working uh, with uh, Coho Commissary, which is a commissary kitchen group in Vancouver. I believe they have five different commissaries in the region, which is awesome. It provides a fantastic opportunity for small local food producers and restaurants that maybe don't have like a brick and mortar that are like food trucks to come and do their processing without the brick and mortar level overhead, which is wonderful. It's opening up a whole new set of opportunities. So working with them to produce um, some holiday workshops right now, which have been the first uh, first iteration. So it's kind of latching in with them who do a lot of local food stuff. This past summer, I did um, a collab with a fellow out here, Shaggy Jack, who, yes, his name is Shaggy Jack's Mushrooms. It is about as like BC Sunshine Coast as you can get. <laughs> like we're talking dreadlocks. It's the whole deal. Um, and he does wild, um, wild food foraging tours and education. And because fish is still the largest wild capture 
food industry in the world, um, you know, I was like, okay, there's a connection there. So I'm always looking for those opportunities. Um, it's a bit of a slow burn as far as local stuff, because shockingly for living on the coast of British Columbia, this particular region is very limited in terms of what we're actually producing um, in terms of like, you know, shellfish, kelp aquaculture, um, fish landing, like it's, it's fairly, it's, and I have, there are a lot of reasons for that, but I'm not sure that I feel like that's an entire other rabbit hole podcast slash thesis, but um, yeah, so I'm always trying to find new collaborators and really 2013, huh, 2023, sorry, I just backtracked there, 10 years ago is still 1990 in my mind, all but good, um, yeah, so I'm now like moving into this year. I've had a lot of opportunity over this past year to connect with more people online, um, more seafood, not only seafood brands, um, but other seafood educators, seafood like fishery scientists, um, fishermen. So I'm really at this point looking to see like how can I drive this into a direction that's more digitally based still do the hands-on local stuff because I feel like that is a really key piece like when people actually have the opportunity to hold a filleting knife and like cut a fish they really like they kind of go that next step where they're like oh it isn't that hard like you know and I'm like takes time but it's still like it's a really good piece of it but how to bring that to a more like make it more accessible to a larger audience through working with others that are maybe not not local because you know we're, we're pretty few and far between as far as of, as far as being the blue foods representatives here on the coast so it's like all right where can i collaborate who can i work with how can we make this better how can we get how can we get this information in front of people blue foods educate what does that mean to you um so yeah when i say blue foods basically that is you know any food that we eat that comes from a marine environment and that can be freshwater, uh, saltwater, wild farm, shellfish, marine plants, fin fish, anything. Um, so what that means to me is basically just providing as much of the, in terms of like straight education, providing people with the facts and tools and awareness to make informed decisions about their food um, based on what is important to them. Um, you know, a big one right now, as we know, um, we're being priced out of existence. So affordability is a really, really top of mind piece right now. Um, so it's like, how do I explain to people how seafood can, you know, you can, you can make seafood a part of your diet while also being able to make choices that are sustainable so that you can feel good about them and keeping your budget, you know, somewhere in the affordability range. Um, and a lot of times that means exposing people to different types of seafood that maybe in, you know, in Western North American culture isn't as typically, you know, grabbed off the shelf. Um, and yeah, so it's really like being an educator in this industry, which is, you know, shifting and changing by the week, day, hour, like, you know, sometimes the fish tea is so hot that like from the start of the day to the end of the day, it's like, okay, there've been seven different policies that have come down and this completely is going to shift compute consumer behavior. All right. Um, right. So it's really like being flexible to shift with what the priorities are in terms of consumer need as well as you know maintaining a certain level of ethical awareness so you know in terms of the sustainability pieces uh just kind of being able to smoothly navigate all of those waters at the same time which is a test of poise for sure um and i will often in workshops you know if i'm if someone asks me a you know a big question that I don't have the answer for. I'll be like, I do not have the background to speak to that. I've studied a lot of fisheries history. 
Um, I, you know, appreciate telling the stories of the food and the people behind it. If you are looking for fish science facts, I can direct you to two Instagram accounts right now. Um, <laughs> if you would like to speak to a fishery science scientist, right. may I introduce? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's it's knowing, you know, it, it's it's shifting in terms of what information is the most relevant um, to your audience that is the most relevant of the time and context because that changes daily. And um, also knowing when to say, hey, I actually don't know that. You know, mm -hmm. I find that particularly when it comes to seafood is already such a, because of recent, you know, I mean, recent misinformation that has been plentifully sprinkled around. Um, it's already hard to gain people's trust. Uh, <laughs> and gain that trust back if it was ever there in the first place. Um, so really being honest and authentic in your storytelling and truth is, you know, I really feel paramount in this industry. It's like coming out and be like, hey, we are people, we're people of the sea. We love the ocean. We respect it more than anyone. It's our livelihood. Here's why, here's why you should participate in it. By the way, it's flipping delicious. <laughs> and here's how you can make it that way. So with so many, um you know, media platforms, special social media, anybody can put anything out there. How do you deal with, I guess, spreading the truth and dealing with the misconceptions, you know, that, you know, people are bringing to you? Um, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's always a tricky one. And I'm, like I'm in a position right now where I am developing, I'm developing my audience. I am not at necessarily the level where I have a lot of come at me bro moments yet, <laughs> but I'm sure I have no doubt they're on their way. <laughs> and so the best thing that I can do in that is number one, like just arm yourself with the facts um, and like, really be prepared to be you know be a calm mind through those through those discussions and try to as well when it comes to any kind of adversarial like context discussion it's like I just am like okay just put yourself in there she's like why what you know what's the end game what's what's the real motivation behind why they're coming at you is it you know because they have a genuine love for a piece of the ocean that they grew up on and they've seen it decimated and it's really easy to point the finger this way um more often than not you know the flip side too if, we're, if we want to get like really i don't know metaphysical and feelsy here it's only 9 a.m here so i'm still working on my coffee this might get real but um oftentimes when you're in a a place with someone who is being adversarial about a, a hot topic, you know, like food, food security and environmental well-being, which is often where a lot of these uh, um, these discussions come out of the base of, you know, there's a lot of anger there. Um, and you've got to think of like, why are they angry? And more often than not, it's, you know, it's because they're afraid of something. They're afraid of losing something. They're afraid of losing a livelihood or losing, you know, losing a, you know, a healthy, healthy environment, losing a future, really, if we want to get really deep on it. Um, that's the reality is, you know, economically, environmentally, with climate change, like there's a lot of fear out there. And, you know, of course, people love the idea of having a future. And when that is, you know, the threat of that is being taken away, and they just want to be able to point fingers, it's also really easy to point fingers at an industry that you can't see because it's out there, it's on the ocean. So, I mean, if you wanna, you know, throw down some Star Wars wisdom, it's the, you know, fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering, thanks Yoda. Um, I feel like honestly approaching it from that perspective and being like, I appreciate, like coming at it from a hard place of, I appreciate you're afraid. How can I help? to like guide you through this so that you understand that this is something that you don't have to be afraid of. These are the good pieces of it. This is what regenerative aquaculture is doing. This is what fisheries management is doing. This is how we're helping, acknowledging the mistakes that you know we and every industry have made in the past and looking at you know 
other ways of doing things so that we can continue to feed our population, but also respect the environment. And that's when I get into the holistic sustainability piece. So yeah, on the on the the higher level, it's it's pretty deep. Um, right, but when right. it comes down to face to face, it's basically just understand, you know, doing my best to understand quickly and empathize with where they're coming from and try and get at that, get at that piece to sort of smooth that fear and be like, this is not something that you have to be afraid of. And here's why. And here's the facts. And here's the, here are your options, you know? So all that in a 30 second span of time is, is really, it's not easy, but we're all doing our yeah, best. Yeah. Oh. Um, I know you've got a class coming up, an oyster class, right? Mm, I did the oyster class. Oh, you um, did the oyster class. Yeah, How did that was go? awesome. Uh, it was it was fantastic. Um, I I'm still you know kind of refining the in person programming that I'm doing and figuring out like okay like what do people like the most you know what do they what do they really want to learn more of oysters are a hot one like everybody wants to learn how to shuck an oyster it's a super it's a fun skill you know you feel like a badass let's be honest a little bit, <laughs> a little bit you know it's like it's it's pretty cool to be able to be like yeah sure i just brought some oysters to the party just no problem right. um so that one was really fun we did um so we had three different types of oysters two west coast one east coast uh we went through tasting them um, and really showing them like how to taste an oyster and how to experience Thank that. Thank you so much. Yes, right? Um, yeah, and explaining the concept of miroir and how the environments impact it and how the time of year impacts different oysters. Um, because, you know, oyster person to oyster person, we know that an oyster in breeding season is going to taste a heck of a lot different than an oyster in the dead of winter. So, yeah. and so it's like communicating that to them and they were mind blown because they're like, oh, I've only ever just sucked an oyster back. And I'm like, you've been missing out. Right. Um, but yeah, so did that. That was really awesome. And then also had them paired with um, a variety of different wines, um, some beers. Uh, and it was, yeah, it was really, really fun. It really kind of elevated the experience for them. And in a way that, you know, they got to enjoy it, but they also sort of were like, hey, this isn't, this isn't actually so hard. Right, right. Like we could do this at home. Yeah. And, you know, and gave them a bit of a rundown on like how to purchase oysters, what you're looking for, how to store them. Um, and, and then you know, I gave them a shucking lesson. A couple people could shuck if they wanted to. So a couple people got, got down with the shucking. Um, I think a couple people had had, uh, were, were a little too comfy in, into the wine mode to, to pick up a knife, which is okay. Um, yeah, it's all part of the fun. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really annoying. People are really, really interested and curious about about oysters and about shellfish. And again, it's one of those things that's a little intimidating, I think. Um, but if you just have, you know, it's like anything, you don't know what you don't know. And if there's someone willing to guide you into it, then a lot of times people will, you know, they'll step a little more boldly, so. Cool, so do you have any more classes or anything, any talks coming up or anything? Uh, yeah, I've got one. So I have one more in this holiday series that's going to be this coming Saturday, uh, December 17th. And um, that's another one that's going to be a Coho Commissary in Gibsons. And it is a, uh, it's a West Coast take on Yule seafood. So traditional Scandinavian Yule traditions feature a ton of seafood, smoked, cured, uh, different treats. And so we are going to craft um what's called gravlax which is a home cured salmon uh it's basically salt sugar spices and soaked in vodka um, so I, I just made some last week and i had some for breakfast just now i can super good Thanks. but uh, so i'm going to teach everyone how to make that uh everybody gets to go home with their own piece of handmade gravlax so it's like half a side of a pink salmon um definitely a, a good deal there and i'll explain to them how to make it and we'll make it there and then 
We're gonna sample some Scandi treats with a West Coast twist. So, you know, some herrings, some mackerel, some smoked salmon, some smoked albacore tuna with a bunch of little accoutrements and um, artisanal goodies. And of course that's gonna have to be paired with mulled wine and mead because Scott, baby, that's how right. we do. Wow. So it's that, uh, yeah. So that's that's a bit more of a Christmas, sort of a holiday flair one. Um, you know, and I'm trying to find ways to incorporate the education pieces. So how to work with this fish, why we're using pink salmon, um, you know, other uses for that, how is this how it's sustainable, and then also, you know, interesting ways to use different types of fish, like I said you know, sardine, herrings, mackerel that aren't the typical thing that people often gravitate towards out here. It's always, you know, it's a can of tuna and don't get me wrong, I love a can of tuna, but it's um, like, I am tin fish trish all the way. But uh, yeah, so exploring some of those things and how those types of seafood are really affordable as well. So kind of just like, um, it's it's that like, hey, I'm gonna do something really fun with you, and I'm also kind of gonna educate you at the mm -hmm. same time. Right, right. Gotta <laughs> so, slip it in. Gotta slip yeah, the education. Exactly. Yeah, you gotta just sort of slide it in there. Yeah. Well, that is that's sort of what I'm in process with right now. Um, I'm thinking what's next is I'm gonna be doing a lot more outreach. I'm going to be rejigging the website keeping that that key piece up front of course but uh adding a lot more info in there i want to start doing more of a video series of little tidbits of uh knowledge info and fun fish fact type things um gonna get a newsletter up going once a month so you know not totally flooding the inbox but you know with new things that are coming up hope to see some more collaborations with a couple of key folks out here um, as well as online, uh, just did a great, um, or participated in Emily from Seaside with Emily's, uh, what was it, Sustainable Seafood Lifestyle course. I did a demo video for that, which was super fun. So hoping for more things like that. And I'm also going to be starting up with the BC Young Fishermen's Network out here, uh, doing some contract work with them uh, which is based on basically supporting the young fishing fleet, getting them access to the resources that they need um, to succeed out here, creating opportunities for connection and community events for them to get together at, to learn um, furthermore education within their own field and connect with their communities. So that's going to be a really, you know, that's going to be a really fun, awesome opportunity over here to be like, all right, like let's actually get hands on with the fleet. And right. You know, see how we can, you know, if we want, I mean, if we want to have seafood, we're going to need fishermen. <laughs> and and if we want to have fishermen, we're going to need to eat seafood. So mm -hmm. again, it kind of comes back to what you said, everything sharpening each other and everything supporting, you know, all of the initiatives supporting each other is kind of my goal. Yeah. So how can the folks uh, stay in contact with you, you know, with the socials and emails or however you, whatever is best? Yeah, for sure. Um, Right now, your best bet is to follow me on Instagram, and that's at Trish Talks Fish, just one word. And then um, my website is www.trishtalksfish.com. Um, I do have a, a sorely underutilized TikTok, but uh, hopefully, hopefully I'll be able to, you know, amp that up in the new year. You know, just get some get some big idiot energy, big idiot fish energy going on there. <laughs> So, yeah, Emily is killing it over there. Emily, Emily is uh, taking it. Such over. a boss. Yeah, yeah. I have. Uh, I've been really grateful to connect with her. Um, also, uh, there's another one. Mackenzie is um, someone on Instagram. She's a fantastic uh, fisheries scientist or marine scientist as well. And the way she delivers information is just so good. Um, right. I'm loving. You know what's happening out there right now with younger people getting on there and you know using these platforms to share this messaging so yeah instagram website um you'll have the opportunity to sign up for my newsletter pretty soon i will be um jamming about that on instagram as well uh keep an eye on my stories everything new kind of comes out comes out on the gram for now 
hoping to spread spread those tentacles soon in the there new year. Go. Yeah. All right. Well, again, I appreciate you for taking time and talking to the folks on Oyster Ninja Podcast. And um, until the next time, um, just keep us updated. For sure. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really great to talk to you. Keep uh, keep your videos rolling. They make my day. And I send them to all my friends. So yeah. Good. Oh, even better. <laughs> I love to hear that. Yeah, they're quality. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. All right. Stay awesome, bud.